Hello, and today we're going to talk about the history of Svalbard. Now, I've seen a few videos about this place on YouTube, especially the preservation of bodies underneath the frozen soil, and the law requiring you to always have a rifle with you in case you come across a polar bear. But I want to cover the history of these islands, and truthfully, that may not be on here very much because it might be a little bland. But I find some aspects of these islands very, very interesting, especially since there's nothing quite like it. And I hope to contribute a brief understanding of the complete history of Svalbard. But first I should probably explain the geography of the islands. Svalbard is between the northern coast of Norway and the North Pole. It consists of over 150 islands and in total it makes up around 61,000 square kilometers. So it's roughly the same size as something like Latvia or West Virginia. The biggest island, Spitsbergen, is the one with permanent settlements, and it's also the island where most of the history takes place. There's not much going on at the other islands, but to the northeast of Spitsbergen is, of course, Northeast Land, or in Norwegian, Nordostlandet, which I always thought shares a similar shape to Iceland. It's also important to note that the small island of Bjornoya is also part of the territory of Svalbard, even though it's 430 kilometers away from the capital of Ylang-Yerbjörn. And as far as I know, Bjornoya doesn't even have any settlements. The only thing you can find there are birds, foxes, and maybe a few scientists every once in a while. Although it was more than 100 years past the Viking Age, it's possible that the Norsemen did discover Svalbard. In 1194, it was written in the Landnamabok, or Book of Settlements, that the Icelanders found an island east of Iceland on a four-day expedition, and they called this island Svalbardi, which means cold coast in Old Norse, and of course this is where we get the modern word. A lot of historians are skeptical of this claim, and I think I am too because there's no archaeological evidence to show the presence of early Icelanders in Svalbard. The actual place the Icelanders may have visited is often speculated to be pack ice. I think it's also possible that it could have been Jan Mayen, which is a small island between Greenland and Svalbard, and it's also owned by Norway. Around 300 years later after the Icelanders made their discovery, in the 1500s, many European nations wanted to find a new way to reach the east through the idea of a northeast passage. In 1553, there was an English explorer, and his name was Hugh Willoughby, and he was looking for the passage, and he claimed to have found an island in the Arctic Ocean. He never set foot on the island or closely observed it, but he called it Willoughby's Land, and Willoughby's Land showed up on a few maps around this time, in around the same area as Svalbard, but it's still highly debated if this was Svalbard or not. In 1596, Wilhelm Behrens was sent to command two ships by the Amsterdam Council to get to China from the north for the first time. In June, a small island was discovered halfway between the northern coast of Norway and the island of Spitsbergen. The crew members managed to kill a polar bear, therefore giving the island the name of Bear Island, or Bjornoya, now a Norwegian. Behrens continued to go north to discover and map several locations of the western island. They named the entire archipelago Spitsbergen something like Pointed Mountains in Dutch. And this was the name the islands would go by for the next few hundred years. Before moving on forward in history, I think I should mention the Palmers. Uh, the Palmers were Russian settlers who came from around the White Sea area, and they eventually did end up in Svalbard. There is no concrete evidence that the Palmers settled the islands before Barents' discovery, but many think they did. They came sometime between the 15th and 17th century to hunt and trap Arctic wildlife. There was no towns or cities, only little hunting stations. Most of the Palmers stopped visiting in the middle of the 19th century, and the USSR later used this to justify the proposed sovereignty over the islands, and it's still a controversial issue today. Because in modern times, you know, of course, Norway owns Svalbard, but the island Spitsbergen is still split between mainly Norwegians and Russians. So finally, after all of the supposed discoveries, and especially after Barents' discovery, was the Golden Age of Svalbard, and that's because at the same time, in the 15 and 1600s, that was the Golden Age of Whaling. And that sounds a little boring, but remember, in the 15 and 1600s, whaling was really important because they needed oil for their lamps, they needed some food, they needed soap, and that's how they made all of that. 
So the King of Great Britain himself, King James I, claimed sovereignty over Spitsbergen in the same way that the Soviet Union wanted to later. They used the Palmers, but a lot of people in Britain used the discovery by Hugh Willoughby to justify the possession of the islands. So the English Muscovy Trading Company attempted to come in 1611, but they shipwrecked. And the next year, the English company came back, and unfortunately for them, they found foreign ships in the water. So they came back again in the next year, in 1613, but this time accompanied by seven English warships, which were granted by the king. This did as they hoped, and it, it really scared off the other countries from the water, but only for that season. So the Dutch had a company that could rival the English company, and that was called the Nordschick Company, or Northern Company, and it was also called the the Greenland Company because a lot of people still assume that the islands of Svalbard were somehow connected to Greenland or some islands right outside of Greenland. It's really interesting to see the maps of the northern area of the world from this time period. So these two giant whaling companies were again pretty evenly matched so they decided to split the island between the two countries instead of fighting all the time. This of course did not last very long because in 1617 an English naval officer ordered for the seizing of cargo on a Dutch ship. Then the next summer in 1618 the Dutch brought with them around 20 ships and attacked the English resulting in the death of three Englishmen. Again, James I held on to his sovereignty of the land and tried multiple times to expel the Dutch. All these times failed, and it certainly didn't help when more countries became involved. By only 1916, the Dutch and Danish settled in a place called Amsterdam Island to the north, which eventually became known as Smeerenburg. The Danes also settled on somewhere called Copenhagen Bay and Danes Island, or Danskoya. The French also made a settlement called Port Louis, and this is around hamburg Bukta. Finally is the English who settled most of southern Spitsbergen. So at this point it's pretty clear to see that Spitsbergen is really this European international zone. Uh, you know, multiple people claim it, but you'd be crazy to think that everything would go peacefully. So in the 1620s and the 1630s, uh, it was probably the most intense times of the Arctic Whaling Age. For a period of time, there was fighting between the English, the Dutch, the Danes, and the French, and sometimes infighting of rival companies from the same country. I could go into individual conflicts in detail, but that would make the video much longer than it needs to be. And there's really nothing too impactful, just a lot of violence. So Spitsbergen became to be known in this era as just a confusing, international, violent territory. Over time, the whalers' technology really developed, and I think it's because they no longer had to be on the coast to process the whale, they could do it on their ships now. So they abandoned all their outposts on the island by the 17th and 18th century. After the whaling age, there's really this period of time where not much is going on, at least compared to how busy the waters were in the whaling age. So of course, the Palmers were still hunting and trapping on the islands, and the Norwegians finally came and joined the Palmers in the late 18th century, and they hunted polar bear, foxes, seals, and they left in the late 20th century. Besides the hunters, the islands were really only visited by a few international scientists, and there's actually a lot of interesting scientific work here, and a lot of it doesn't have to do with what you would think. After these intermediate years, there was the Age of Cool, which really brings us into modern times. Coal was originally found on Spitsbergen by the whalers, but they didn't really take advantage of it. There were multiple attempts later to start mining settlements. I think in the late 1800s, there were quite a few, but they all failed. One of the failed settlements was sold to an American industrialist named John Longyear. Longyear started a new enterprise called the Arctic Coal Company in 1906. A settlement was made around the area to house the workers. The settlement was called Longyear City and eventually became Svalbard's capital city. In only four years after Longyear's investment, there were over 200 people working for him in the Arctic Coal Company. The company proved that mining was not only possible, but very profitable in this Arctic region. Later businesses from Sweden, the Netherlands, Russia, and Norway all started settlements on Spitsbergen. The island now had a permanent population and it was steadily growing. Later in the early 1900s, the Spitsbergen Treaty was signed during the International Peace Conference of Versailles in 1920. The treaty declared that Spitsbergen officially belonged to Norway. This was probably because Norway was neutral during the Great War, so they were looked at as somewhat harmless. There were to be no military bases on the islands, and for the most part, there were still 
in international territory. The treaty also gave the Norse name back with the islands to suit the Norwegian ruling. The populated Western Island continued to use the Dutch name. Although Svalbard was officially owned by Norway, it's still basically an international territory. And there are residents of many backgrounds, a lot of which are coming from the Soviet Union. A decade later, after the signing of the treaty, in the 1930s, many of the mining companies found that it was too hard to maintain their businesses, and all of which closed down with the exception of Stor Norsk and the Soviet state-fueled Arctic Ugel. We know that Norway was occupied by Germany in World War II, and for the most part Svalbard was left untouched at first. But when Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, the Barents Sea became an important passageway for the Western Allied Powers to provide resources to the Soviets. On August 25th, 1941, the Allies started a operation. Germany was expected to invade the archipelago in order to use it as a base to attack convoys. Canada, Britain, and the remaining free Norwegians started Operation Gauntlet. The Allies evacuated the locals of Spitsbergen and destroyed the coal mines and shipping facilities. This way, if the Germans took over the islands, they would have no resources. The plan was mostly a success, but Germany would still use the island for weather stations. Free Norwegian soldiers attempted to claim Svalbard again by putting up Allied weather stations. The German Navy destroyed these and captured many Norwegian soldiers, which were all sent to prisoner of war camps. Then, by the end of the war, Norway started to reconstruct its losses on the island. Soon after, the Russian settlements would be reconstructed as well. Finally, I want to talk about Svalbard in modern times. I think the biggest thing that happened since World War II would be that some of the Russian settlements began to lose momentum. Schools were closed and families were sent to mainland Russia. And this happened in the 90s. This is what caused the famous abandoned town of Pyramiden, which really is an interesting site. At around the same time, hotels were being constructed and this sort of kick-started the tourism industry. Svalbard is still known for its scientific endeavors. It has a lot of scientific research outposts, notably the Global Seed Vault, which is a large bunker built in 2008 which now holds over 20 million seeds from all around the world. Okay, I'd like to thank you for watching, and if you have any disagreements, I'd like you to leave a comment, and we could have a nice civil discussion down below.